name is Pastor Brian. I'm your Irvine campus pastor, and I have the honor and privilege of being with all of you tonight at our midweek worship experience. So good to see you guys here on a Wednesday night. Come on, the real party's here on a Wednesday night, not down off the harbor. And uh, I'm honored to be able to be here with all of you tonight. And we're a house of honor. Okay, one of our core values here at Freedom House is honor. So we always lead with honor. And I would not be leading right if I didn't first give honor to our lead pastors, Pastor Sai and Pastor Marie Silva. I would not be who I am here today as a pastor, as a leader, as a husband, as a father, as a man of God, if it was not for their leadership, for their guidance, for their mentorship, for their coaching. Um, and so I honor them here this evening. I'm grateful for them, honor my wife and my kids, all four of them, uh, because they release me on a daily basis to be able to build God's house and answer the call of God uh, on my life and for our family. And so I'm so uh, just honored to have such an amazing family. And I'm honored to be here with all of you tonight as we continue our study through the book of Acts. If you didn't get a control note sheet on your way in, just go ahead and lift up your hands. The ushers will get that to you. Our control notes is, is just the scriptures we're gonna be reading tonight. Uh, sometimes if you come on a Sunday, things of that nature, we have points. Um, our midweeks, we've been treating it more of like a Bible study method. So we just kind of leave some blank lines for you to be able to write down the notes because there's gonna be three voices speaking. There's gonna be my voice, there's going to be your voice in your head saying, don't listen to that guy. He doesn't know what he's talking about. And then the third voice can be the Holy Spirit speaking to you. And so we just want you to be able to take notes because the word of God is a lot is uh, more powerful when you take it home with you. Uh, I like I like to tell our Irvine campus every now and then if I gave each and every one of you a $10,000 check when you came into the sanctuary today, you would make sure that before you left this building, you had that check in your hand. And if you didn't, you'd run back in and you'd grab it because you're like, I'm going straight to the bank and I'm putting that in my account tonight. Um, well, the truth is, is the word of God is far more valuable than any dollar amount that we could put on a check. Yet, if we're honest with ourselves, sometimes we walk out and we forget what we learned right here in our seat. So we want to help you take that home with you tonight. Go ahead and turn, uh, or go ahead and take a look at your notes. You can look at the screen. You can open up your Bible if you got it, like I got mine here. And we're going to read here in Acts chapter 5. And I was joking with Pastor Lou and Pastor Tom earlier. I'm like, man, every time it's my turn to speak on the book of Acts, I'm talking about somebody getting arrested or being released from prison. I, I can only, I only got so many prison illustrations to give all of you guys. But I'm going to try one more. Uh, here tonight, but to pick up where we left off, Acts chapter 5, okay, Acts chapter 5, last couple of weeks, you know, the pastors, they got the tough ones, they got to talk about Ananias and Sapphira, and, you know, not being obedient to God, and, you know, because they weren't obedient, there was consequences to their disobedience, um, and here in Acts chapter 5, verse 17, where we pick it up, it says, then the high priest and all of his associates who were members of the party of the Sadducees were filled with jealousy okay they were filled with jealousy and to to pick pick it up and and to catch up to speed maybe tonight's your first time here or you've been coming for a little while but you're like man I, what's going on here in the book of acts in acts chapter one jesus had already resurrected from the dead he'd already resurrected from the grave and he spends 40 days teaching his disciples equipping them saying look i gotta go I got to go to heaven. I got to go be with my father. You guys are going to be my extension. You guys are my disciples. You're the one that's going to take what I've imparted into you. The Holy Spirit's going to come upon you and you're going to go and you're going to take my gospel to all ends of the earth. The reason we're here today is because there was disciples who actually believed in Jesus. Who said, Jesus, we believe you. We're taking you at your word. They were filled with this spirit. And they said, we're going to go to all ends of the earth, which is why we're having church in Orange County here tonight. Okay, we are the extension of the book of Acts. But Jesus told them, you're going to go to Samaria, to Judea. You're going to go to all ends of the earth. What Jesus gave them, what Pastor Josiah talked about this past Sunday. He doesn't have a mission for his church. He has the church for his mission. The mission was always this. You're going to take my gospel. You're going to 
make disciples. You're going to go to all ends of the earth. What did he mean that by that? He says that anybody who doesn't know who I am, you're going to go and be the extension of that. You're going to be the evangelist. You're going to be the ones to go and share the good news that there is freedom, that there is salvation, that you don't have to stay locked in your guilt or locked in your shame or locked in your condemnation, but you can be set free from those chains if you would just come to know me. So he gave them a mission. He gave them a mission. Now, when you're on mission, there are oftentimes opposition to the mission that you're on. No matter what it is, We've talked about it in weeks past, how there are always tests along the way and our perspective of the test will determine how we persevere. Because oftentimes we have a negative connotation to test, but a test is really just to show what we've already absorbed. In school, you're given a test for you to show what you've learned. It's not meant to fail you, it's just meant for you to actually activate what's already been put in you. And so time after time, the disciples and the apostles, they would face tests. And here in Acts chapter 5, they are now facing another test for them taking a stand for their faith. And it says that some of the religious members, okay, some of the Sadducees, they were some of the religious leaders at the time, but they were that. They were religious. It was, wasn't about relationship. It was about stature. It was about this is my title and you better do things our way or we're gonna punish you for it. It says they were filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles and put them in the public jail. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. He says, go stand in the temple courts. And he said, tell all people about this new life. At daybreak, they entered the temple courts as they had been told and began to teach the people. When the high priest and his associates arrived, they called together the Sanhedrin, the full assembly of the elders of Israel, and they sent to the jail for the apostles. But on arriving at the jail, the officers did not find them there. So they went back and they reported, we found the jail, it was securely locked. The guards were still there. But when we opened up the door, we found no one inside. On hearing this report, the captain of the temple guard and the chief priests were at a loss. They were wondering what this might lead to. Then someone came and said, look, the men you put in jail are standing in the temple courts. They're teaching the people. At that, the captain went with his officers and brought the apostles. They did not use force because they feared the people would stone them. The apostles were brought in and made to appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name. He said, yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. What they mean by that is what, what the apostles were, were proclaiming was that it was the religious leaders who crucified Jesus that they crucified the Messiah. They crucified the Christ. And the Sadducees are more worried about their stature and their title, and they can't be seen to have blood on their hands. Verse 29, Peter said, Peter and the apostles replied, we must obey God rather than human beings. He said, we must obey God rather than human beings. And we could just end the night right there and you could go home and you'll already be set free. Because too often we try to impress the people that are right next to us rather than saying, God, my life is not my own. My life belongs to you. It is you who I owe myself my salvation to. It is you that I owe my, my heart to. And God, I, I'd be remiss if I allow somebody else to dictate the course of my life above you. But Lord, you're the one that died for my sins. You're the one that freely forgives me day in and day out. And if it's you that forgives me, and if it's you that my salvation belongs to, Lord, then nobody else matters. Not their opinion, not their comments, not their love, not anything that they can say or do to me. Because Lord, as long as I know that I am in right standing with you, that is all that I need. That is all that I need. Verse 30. 
authority, the God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on a cross. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior that he might bring Israel to, rep to repentance and forgive their, their sins. Verse 32, we are witnesses of these things and so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. We're gonna dive a little bit deeper into this passage here in the book of Acts. And we don't always give titles for you know, our Bible studies, but if I had to give you a title tonight, it'd be On Bended Knee, okay? Not the boys to men version, but On Bended Knee. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Jesus, for your presence, Lord. We thank you for your spirit, Lord God. We ask, Lord, that may your Holy Spirit, may your Holy Spirit be the loudest voice in this room and in our hearts tonight, Lord Jesus. We pray that as we Receive your word, God. May it bring transformation to our lives, Lord God. May it dictate the course of our lives. May it dictate the course of our marriages. May it dictate the course of our family, Lord God. May it dictate the posture of our hearts. In Jesus' mighty name, somebody say amen. Come on, turn to your neighbor. Say welcome home one more time. Go ahead and take a seat here. Now, as, as we jump in, into this passage, um, as I talked about, I was like, man, I got to talk about another prison passage here in the book of Acts. But the reality is, is, is like I said, is in our walk with God, there are going to be many oppositions okay, that come that are trying to distract us or derail us from achieving who God has called us to be. The reality is it started in the book of Genesis, okay, with Adam and Eve. Okay, Adam and Eve didn't do anything. Adam and Eve were just them. The devil did not like that. Okay, the serpent did not like that. The serpent did not like, okay, that Adam and Eve had relationship with God and that he didn't. And so because he was miserable, as the saying goes, misery loves company. So he says, you know what? If I can never be eternally happy, what I'm going to do then is I am going to make it my sole purpose to try to rip God's people away from him. That is where sin is then introduced. And the reality is the enemy has been on mission since that day, and we will never escape it. Okay, we will never escape sin. Okay, not until we're reunited with our heavenly father in heaven. What we can do is we can overcome sin, okay, and we could grow through it, but we'll never be perfect until we make it to that day. And so if we're never going to be perfect, then what we have to do, what we can do is we can continue to get better. We can continue to get stronger. We can continue to pray and rely on our Heavenly Father more and more. We can continue to seek the Holy Spirit and, and ask the Holy Spirit Okay, to fill us up into what we call sanctification. You're like, sanctification, what's that? Jump into Bible college, okay? We'll break it all down there for you. We just had our first night of classes last Tuesday. Come on, where's all the Bible college students at? And I put it this way for our Bible college students last night. I said, if we, if we really want to value the access that we have to our Heavenly Father, all we got to do is read the Bible. Because if you read the whole first half of the Bible, known as the Old Testament, okay, it'll talk about a time when humans, like you and I, didn't have direct access to God. Meaning we couldn't just pray and God hear us. Now God could hear us, okay, because he's God. He can do all things. But God would not respond to the prayer of all of his people because we were in sin. God would show favor on whom, on whom he showed favor to. That's where he would select a priest or select a prophet, and that priest or prophet would then become the mouthpiece for God. And the rest of humanity had to look at that as favor of, thank you, Lord, that you've selected Moses to be the prophet for us, that when he speaks, he speaks on your behalf, and we can respond. But now, after Jesus dies for our sins, after he raises from the grave, after he pays the final sacrifice for us, when we come to that salvation knowledge and we say, Jesus, we believe that you are our Lord and Savior, we now have 
direct access to Jesus. It is that direct access to Jesus and his spirit that then gives us the ability to become more like Christ, which makes us able to overcome the power of sin. It's why it's the only way that strongholds can be broken. What's a stronghold? Anything that has a stronghold on your life. It's the only way that, that, that addictions can be broken. It's the only way that we can be utterly set free from condemnation and sin is through Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay? But all the enemy needs is for you to have an off day, for you to have an off week, for you to have an off month. I tell our Bible college all the time, one of the most painful conversations I've ever had as a pastor is, Somebody who said, I just wanted a month. Just wanted a month to go back and be the old me. Completely change their life forever. Because they just wanted a month. All the enemy needs is a moment. The Bible says all he needs is, 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 is a foothold. All he needs is to be able to grab onto that one pinky toe and get us to trip up. So as we pick it up here in the book of Acts, the apostles and the disciples, they're facing obstacle after obstacle after obstacle because the enemy does not want them to fulfill the call of God on their life. The reason the enemy fights you is because he knows there is a calling and a destiny over your life. And if he could prevent you from living out that calling, if he could prevent you from living for Christ, then guess what? He could prevent your children and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren from ever Ever coming to know him but the obstacles are always going to come because the enemy is always looking for an opportunity to bring a distraction so as the apostles are carrying out this mission and they're sharing the good news and they're they're healing people and they're, they're seeing demons be uh, uh, the, 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 their deans, they're seeing demons being cast out and impure spirits being released and 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 Jesus is making his spirit known here in the, in, in, in the area of Jerusalem, the, the religious people, they begin to get angry. You ever walk into uh, maybe a family function or you walk into a restaurant or you go to somebody's house and you're like, there's just something feels off about this place. You, you ever feel that way? Okay. Um, this was the opposite, okay? The apostles and the disciples they go into the town and because of what they carry within them, it begins to shift the atmosphere that they step foot in. What you need your prayers to be, okay, if you're like, oh, I don't like going to that person's house because it just gives me the, the eebie-jeebies, you know what I mean? Whatever the eebie-jeebies means. Your prayer needs to become, Lord, may I not feel them, but when I walk into a room, whatever room that may be, whatever atmosphere that may be, may they feel the spirit of God that resides inside of me. May they get the eebie-jeebies because they know that there is something in me that their spirit doesn't want. Okay? That's what these apostles carried. So when they walk in, it says that the Sadducees became jealous because sometimes we think the eebie-jeebies means you're scared. No, sometimes it'll, it'll bring about a spirit of jealousy. It'll bring about a spirit of animosity. Okay, like the saying goes, they hate me because they ain't me. Okay, it's the old time, you know, all the new kids, they talk about drip and stuff like that. I don't know. Use a towel, bro. Um, but the reality is my, my, my parents, uh, my parents used to tell me because I'd be like, man, they always, people are always picking on me. You're like, ah, they're just jealous because they're not you. I'd be like, really? <laughs> that was definitely not it. But hey, it worked for me. But the reality is Satan is jealous of the relationship that we have with Jesus because he forfeited that. So if you see people that are jealous, people start to hate on you a little bit. Okay, now, if you're doing things you're not supposed to, then don't misinterpret this. But if you're living for Jesus and people just don't like you because you say that you believe in Jesus, it is okay. Do not try to please them. Know that you are pleasing God. And as long as you please God, you're not going to be able to please everybody, but it's okay. Jesus didn't say go and please everybody. He said go and spread my gospel, make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
So as these disciples begin to go into these towns and they begin to share the good news and they begin to spread the gospel and they're praying for people and people are being set free and they're saying, we want to serve the Jesus that you serve, the religious people, they begin to get upset. They begin to become jealous, as the word says in the NIV translation. So what do they do? They arrest them. They say, if we just keep letting these guys go, people are responding to them. They're going to be stronger than us, and we definitely can't have them be stronger than us. So their only resolution is, you know what, their only solution to the problem is, let us just arrest them. We'll just keep them locked up. But how many of you know you cannot lock up the purpose and the mission of God for your life? It's why, it's why God tells Moses in Exodus 14, 14, he says, you, I will fight for you. You just need to be still. You don't got to worry about how I'm going to do it. You just continue to put your trust in me. Even if it looks like all oh, hell is breaking loose, even if it looks like chaos is ensuing around you, as long as you continue to put your trust in me, I will fight for you. Stop trying to take it into your own hands. You don't need to. God will do it for you. God will do it for us. And so even though they tried to, uh, even though they arrested the apostles, they could not detain the purpose or the mission of God. And so it says an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Brought them out. Now, if we really talk about what's taking place in the context of the story, because I'm big on context, because it does add to what's going on here. The apostles didn't hurt nobody. The apostles didn't break any law. The apostles weren't trying to fight these religious leaders. They weren't even trying to oppose the religious leaders. They were simply being who God had called them to be. They were simply operating under the direction of the Holy Spirit that filled them. Point number one, because I'm gonna give you some points tonight. The enemy is scared of what's in you. The enemy is scared of what is in you. He's not scared of what's on you. He don't care what labels you got on your shirt. He don't care what kind of shoes you got on. He doesn't care what kind of car you drove here in. You can look good all you want. You can look terrible all you want. What matters most is what is inside of you. What, what the enemy recognizes is not how you carried your Bible into the auditorium. He doesn't recognize if you wore a Christian t-shirt in here or not. What he recognizes is, is the spirit of God in that person. Because if the spirit of God ain't in that person, I ain't got to worry about it. But if the spirit of God is in that person, then guess what? We got to set up some opposition. How do I know that? Because it didn't just happen to the apostles. It happened to Jesus as well. Mark chapter 5, verse 1 through 10, it says, They went across to the lake of the region of the Gerasenes. When Jesus got out of the boat, okay, he didn't oppose nobody. He didn't talk to nobody. He didn't, he didn't try to start casting out demons. It just says that Jesus just got out of the boat. Jesus just entered the room. And it says, when he got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him, that the enemy literally recognized when Jesus touched land, that the enemy literally recognized when the Holy Spirit, when, the, when Jesus the Messiah entered into what was formerly his region. I said formerly because once Jesus touched down, it was no longer the enemy's region. Once Jesus touches down in your heart, you are no longer enemy's territory. Once you confess that Jesus is your Lord and Savior, you are no longer what you used to be. You are no longer what you were yesterday, last month, last year, five years ago, ten years ago. You are not your mistakes. You are not your misfortunes. You are not your addictions. You are a new creation. And so it says that as Jesus touches down on land, the enemy instantly responded he would go on and say that his name was legion because he had many demons inside of him and he's like just he asks and begs for mercy from Jesus. imagine that demons asking for mercy so why is it that we as believers sometimes we hear the word demon and we're like oh 
Oh no, that's scary. No, 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 it's not scary. The enemy's actually scared of what's in you. We gotta stop walking around like we're scared of so-and-so or we're scared of this or scared of that. No, 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 the, the God, the Holy Spirit that is in me is what strengthens me, is what propels me, is what leads me. That is what literally shakes the enemy to its core. That there is nothing that can overcome me as long as I am walking in obedience with the Spirit. You see, it's not what's on the exterior that distinguishes you. It's what's on the interior that distinguishes you. It's what sets you apart. That even in this room, even in this room, what distinguishes you is the Holy Spirit inside of you. It's what doesn't allow you to just sit in your seat. It doesn't allow you to just stand there and not worship because the Spirit of God can only respond to the Heavenly Father with worship. It's what sets you apart. It's what puts the enemy on notice. 1 John 4.4 4. It says, but you belong to God, my dear children. You have already won a victory over those people because the spirit who lives in you is greater than the spirit who lives in the world. I'll say it again, that the spirit who lives in you is greater than the spirit who lives in the world. That regardless of the curriculum, okay, that is being taught at your kid's school, the spirit that lives in them is greater than the spirit of the world. That regardless of what trauma you may have experienced in your life, the spirit in you is greater than the spirit of the world. That regardless of what hardship you may have faced, that regardless of what the enemy has accused you of, that regardless of what your history shows, that regardless if you're scared to scroll down on your Instagram profile, the spirit that lives in you is greater than the spirit of the world. It's why the enemy is afraid because if the spirit of God resides in you, then you are already victorious. If the spirit of God resides in you, then there is nothing the enemy can do to separate you from the love of God. So that's just a clever saying. It's scripture. It is God's word. It is true. It is inerrant. It is infallible. It does not return void. It is inexhaustible, meaning it never runs out. And so if God said it, and he said there is nothing that can separate you from the love of God, then there is nothing that can separate you from the love of God. Because the spirit in you is greater than the spirit of this world. We just have to stay in tune. Like I was teaching our Bible college students last night. We have to stay in tune with the Spirit. How do we stay in tune with the Spirit? We stay disciplined. How do you stay in tune with your health? You continue to go to the gym. You continue to eat right. You continue to do it on a daily basis. You can't work out once a month and expect to be in shape. Expect to be fit, expect to be healthy. But yet sometimes we think that, Lord, if I just come to church once a month, I'm going to be good. Paul says physical, physical training is of some value, but your spirit, the spiritual training is worth far more. That when we pray, that when we read the word, that when we study the word, that when we put our faith and our trust in God's hands and not in our own hands, not in our own wisdom. That's why Proverbs says repeatedly that the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. That true wisdom is when we acknowledge that, Lord, apart from you, I have no wisdom. That apart from you, what I think I know is folly. But when I am in alignment with you, when I'm in accord with you, when I'm in step with you, your wisdom, Lord, there is nothing sweeter than it. Your spirit, Lord, there is nothing more profitable than it. But it comes from being in step with him. As we continue in the passage I love Peter's response in Acts 5, 29. He says, Peter and the apostles replied, we must obey God rather 
than human beings. We must obey God rather than human beings. What was Peter saying? Peter saying, I'm not relying on the gift that I have. I'm not gonna rely on what seems to make sense. I'm not gonna just walk in step with you because you tell me to. I am going to obey God because that who had that, let me say it better. I'm gonna obey God because he's the one that's commissioned me. And if he's the one that's commissioned me, he's the only one that can make me go faster or who can make me stop. And so even when you appear to put your hands, even when you appear to be an obstacle, even when you appear to put a halt to the mission of God that is working within me, I know that he who began a good work in me, as Paul says in Philippians 1, is faithful to complete it. That regardless of what the enemy says, regardless of how many times they try to criticize me, regardless of how they try to put a hold on me, regardless of how the circumstances around me may appear, that as long as I bend my knee to God and not to man, God, you will see me through the fire. You will see me through the obstacle. You will see me through the valley. You know, oftentimes, oftentimes we as believers, we can find ourselves in what we call valleys. We call moments where it feels dry or you feel like, man, I just, just don't feel like it. You know, anytime we, anytime we do a, a wedding ceremony, we always reassure the husband and wife that love is not a feeling. Love is a choice that is accompanied by a feeling. I'll say it again. Love is a choice that is accompanied by a feeling. talk about discipline and if you're in Bible college I talk about discipline a lot and my wife and I are on this health kick and we've been working out and the other night we went to the gym and I said we got out and I said you know what I really didn't want to come here tonight I really did it it was like midnight I was tired it was a long weekend I ate too much bad food so my body didn't feel like working out I said but I knew we needed to come how much more valuable is that piece of advice for our walk with God? See, sometimes we feel like, God, I just, I just can't hear you right now. God's like, really? Can't hear me right now? That's crazy. Because of, I've given you my word. It's there for you to read. It is the living word. It is sharper than any double-edged sword. It is life-giving. Oh, but you, so you want my hand, you don't want my word. You want my hand, you don't want my heart. You want my hand, you don't want my spirit. Oftentimes, if we're honest, we will look for more excuses why not to read God's word why not to serve in his house, why not to grow in our relationship with him, then we will to actually grow. Then we will to actually read our word. Then we will to actually, you know what? I can think of 10 different reasons why I can't serve. But can you think of one of why you should? I got one for you. The Bible says that he who refreshes others, will he himself be refreshed. That in your service, that in your refreshing of other people, even when you don't feel like it, even when it feels like a strain, you yourself will be refreshed. Imagine that. That when you do something for somebody else, it actually refreshes you. It actually refreshes you. Stand to your feet with me this evening. We're gonna come to a close here soon, but. You know, Jesus said he would use the foolish things to confound the wise. Jesus made statements like the last shall be first 
and the first shall be last. He made all of these statements that didn't make much sense when you take them at face value. But when you understand that God's system, God's processes are not meant to make sense all the time, you actually find the truth in them. That when God told Moses, Moses, just stay still. You don't got to worry about fighting. I will fight for you. That what God was saying is, Moses, this test that you feel that you're in right now as you're leading these people, did I not tell you that you would lead them to the promised land? Moses, did I not tell you that? And Moses was like, yes, God, you told me. You told me you're going to lead them to the promised land. But all I see is this sea. How are we? The Egyptians, they're coming. He said, I didn't tell you to worry about the Egyptians. I didn't tell you how you were going to get there. I said, lead the people to the promised land. Sometimes we're like, but God, but how is this going to work out the way my check account, my bank account works? It just doesn't add up. God, have you seen my family? God, have you seen our history? Have you seen the struggles? Have you seen the things we've had to deal with? How could we possibly be set free from those things? How could we possibly make a difference? How could we possibly go in a different direction? This is the only direction our family has ever known. My dad did it that way. My, 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 my grandpa did it that way. My great grandpa did it that way. All of us have done it that way. How are we supposed to possibly go in a different direction? God says, are you done trying to figure it out? He said, Moses, I didn't tell you to come up with a solution. He said, I didn't tell you how to figure it out. I didn't call you to be the navigator. I called you to be the follower. I called you to be the disciplined one, the disciple. That when you put your faith and put your trust in me, I will work out the things that don't make any sense to anybody else in the room. But what I can guarantee is that when you step in, the atmosphere will begin to change. That when you put your trust in me, all of a sudden, interiorly, you're going to be like, this don't feel right, but it feels right at the same time. Why? Because I'm the one that's working in you and working through you. It may seem inevitable. It may seem unconquerable. But with God, all things are possible. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord Jesus. We thank you right now, Lord God, for your spirit. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you have called us. We thank you, Lord God, for the anointing that you have poured on us and in us, Lord. Hey, thanks so much for watching our service at Freedom House OC. Don't forget to like and subscribe. It's always my honor, my wife's honor to bring you God's word. And I know that God's best is in your future. Make sure to share, uh, click the bell icon so you're always up to date when new content comes out because we want to be a blessing to your life. We want this channel to be a channel that feeds your future and leads you closer to God. Hey, we love you. God bless.